Now we have to take a moment for some shameless self-promotion. A while ago we did an appearance at a gun show. They invited us to come back. So on Saturday and Sunday, 11 and 12 March 2023, the crew and I will be at the Rick Rial Gun Show that's held at the Polk County Fairgrounds in Polk County, Oregon. We'll have some guns on display, we'll have the three-day survival pack, we'll have some t-shirts, maybe we'll tell some anecdotes that aren't really fit to be told in this format. Either way, come out and say hi, it should be fun. Okay, let's get to today's presentation. Hi, we're out on our range today, and we're talking about having faith, confidence, belief, and trust in your ammunition, your firearm, and your ability to use them. Now, we're doing something that we've never done before, which is we're making two versions of the same presentation, a short version and a very long version. You're watching the long version. And so you'll get to see all of the Shatner-esque pauses, the dawn of time explanations, the many anecdotes and everything else. And it comes with four caveats. One, we are going to do some demonstration, but for the most part, all I'm going to do today is talk. And when I talk, I'm going to talk about my opinions. My opinions are based on my observations, my education, my training, my experience. Different people have different experiences, so they have different opinions, and I make no claim that mine has its origin in the mind of greatness. Two, I may mention a little bit about shotguns and rifles and hunting and competition shooting, but I'm talking primarily about handguns for concealed carry personal protection home defense. Three, it makes it easier to make my point if I say, you should think of this and you should remember that. Okay, what you should really remember is that I am not in any way trying to tell you what to do. I'm only explaining what I do and why. Nothing I say today should be inferred as any kind of tutorial or recommendation. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. And four, if you're going to tell me how bad, wrong, and stupid I am, please put a little bit of effort into knowing what you're talking about. Okay, that having been said, in discussing having faith, confidence, belief, and trust in your ammunition and your firearm and your ability to use them, I want to discuss things like how to know when you're talking to somebody whose conclusions are based on a baseless belief system, how to not be that person, how to get that trust in your firearm, what to do if your firearm fails to achieve your trust, and how to correct those kind of problems and it's going to require a very long explanation and a very long presentation, and here we are. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about are going to be police shootings and things like that, and things that police officers go through. Okay, keep in mind I am not a police officer. I have, have not been a police officer. And so when I discuss this, a lot of people are going to become incredulous and they're going to ask me questions like, oh yeah, well what the hell do you know about it? Okay. <sighs> Let's take a survey. Show of hands. If you've ever been in a shooting, you know, where you had to shoot someone and or someone shot at you and you had to shoot back, if you ever been in such a situation, raise your hand. My hand is up. Is yours? Okay. Now, another thing that I want to put in perspective is, as I've mentioned before, I'm a certified dental assistant and I spent many years working in various dental clinics. In the dental clinic, we have a defibrillator, so in case someone has an infarction in the office, we can keep them alive until the EMTs get there. And I'll be the first to tell you that I never had to use the defibrillator. I know they get used occasionally, but I'm not personally acquainted with anyone who ever had to use it. But every day when I go to work, I know that it's very unlikely that I'll have to use the defibrillator, but I might have to someday. And that day might be today. And if I don't use it correctly, someone's going to die. 
And that's something you always have in the very back of your mind. Now, for armored car drivers or police officers, or for at least some of the time when I was in the military doing such things, you every day go to work with the notion that it's really very unlikely you're going to get into a shooting. If you look at the mode average, you know, the number that appears the most often, the most common number of shootings a police officer has been in is zero. But every time you go to work, every single day, you know that it's very unlikely you're going to get into a shooting, but it could happen someday, and that day might be today. And if you do it wrong, somebody, or at least the wrong person, could very well die. Therefore, you have to be aware that this is the situation, and you've got to know you have to do it right. Now, when you get into a shooting, there's going to be, or at least there should be, a lot of things going through your mind. Things like, there's my adversary, but there's somebody else over there. Is that another adversary or just a witness? Wait, there's somebody pulling something out. Is he pulling out a phone or is that a gun? Here's my adversary. What's my potential for collateral damage due to overpenetration? And the list goes on and on. You've already got a lot of things to think about. What you can't be thinking about are things like, gee, they told me I only had to train at 3, 3, and 3, and that guy's 12 yards away. Can I hit him from here? If I do hit him, is my ammunition powerful enough to penetrate his clothing? And even if it does, is it powerful enough to stop the threat? And for that matter, am I really sure my gun's going to go off when I pull the trigger? You can't be thinking about things like that. You have to be thinking about things like, here's my adversary, what are the potential for collateral damage, and so on. And so you have to have trust in your firearm, your ammunition, and your ability to use them. And I want to discuss today how to recognize that you don't have that trust, how to understand the concept of dealing with people that come to conclusion based on their baseless belief system, what to do to get that trust, and how to recognize when, after you've done those things, that you don't have that trust, and what to do when you don't. And that's going to require a lot of anecdotes and a very long explanation. Now, let me start with what a viewer referred to as people's baseless belief system. There's a lot of people that are of the opinion that certain calibers are great and certain ones are not. And a lot of times their conclusions are not based on anything. They're based on some story somebody told them decades ago or based on just something they thought up, not based on any kind of trial and error or experimentation or empirical evidence or anything. And there are people like that, and you have to recognize when you're dealing with someone like that. Now, let me tell you a few anecdotes. A while ago, I was in an event, and I was talking to somebody who was, I think, over 80 years old. And he had been a police officer for a relatively short time, well over 50 years ago. And he talked about carrying a revolver. And that to this day, he would carry a revolver and he would never carry an autoloader because, quote, I don't believe in them, close quote. Okay, now I have no idea what experience he had that led him to that conclusion. But you got to catch, he said he doesn't believe in them. Just by use of that word makes me think that he thought that up as opposed to basing that on any real observation. But that's the kind of guy that if you took him to the range and you had your Glock and a suitcase full of magazines and that guy sat there and watched you shoot a thousand rounds without a single malfunction of any kind, you still wouldn't convince him that the firearm is reliable because he doesn't believe in it. And that's his belief system and there's no way you'll ever change that. Now, let me tell you another one. One of my crew carries an auto-loading pistol every day. But he also has revolvers for other applications. And he thinks Smith & Wesson revolvers are the greatest thing going. Okay. And 
So when I show him my Ruger Security 6, he has your typical song and dance, oh, Ruger, oh, Ruger, that's so terrible. It's a rock solid gun, it's very accurate. I can shoot it accurately. And I told him it also, by Ruger standards, has an outstanding trigger pull. Oh, by Ruger standards? Well, by Ruger standards, it'd still be terrible. So I hand him the thing, okay, dry fire this. And he did, and he very begrudgingly had to admit that that really was a good trigger pull. But he still can't accept it. That, well, it must have had a trigger job. Because he can't accept that the Ruger could ever be good because that's outside the parameters of his belief system. Now, whether or not my Security 6 had a trigger job, I don't know. It was 30 years old when I bought it. I do not know the history of it. Maybe it does. I don't know. Don't really care. Now, let me tell you another anecdote about belief systems. Just about four days ago, I was driving down the freeway, and I noticed that the car in front of me was an Audi and that the car beside me and a little bit ahead was also an Audi. In fact, I think they were the same model. And that made me think, okay, this is a precarious situation because when one of those Audis breaks down, I'm in a position where I won't be able to get out of the way because I have utmost confidence that it's an Audi, it's gonna break down. Now, some time ago, another member of the crew who keeps up on modern car trends was telling me that Audi had a new model and it was super fast and all this and I said something to the effect of can it go 200 miles an hour well no of course it can't go that fast then it's useless to me because at that time we were at a place that was about 50 miles from the coast and I said because if it can go 200 miles an hour then I can get from here to the coast in 15 minutes and it has to be able to get to the coast in 15 minutes because an Audi can't drive any more than 15 minutes without breaking down. And that's my belief system. Now, on what do I base that? Okay, to give you the short version of a very long story, back when I was a kid, I mean a little kid, my mother had an Audi. Over-engineered, underpowered, unreliable. The car was a piece of junk. She eventually got rid of it and got another Audi. Over-engineered, underperforming, unreliable. The car was a piece of junk. Now, a few years later, a colleague of mine had an Audi and I had an occasion to ride in it. And I'm looking at it, oh, oh you've got a sunroof. To which she says, yeah, it doesn't work. The switch that makes it open doesn't work. And besides that, it leaks. And besides that, she went on to explain, most of the other cool gadgets in the car don't work. And then she said that the car was a piece of junk. Don't think she used those exact words, but that's what she said. Now, I could go on, but you get my point. And what that leaves me with is my belief system that Audis are complete garbage and you can't run fast enough to give me an Audi. If someone did give me an Audi, all I'd do with it is drive it out here to the range, making sure someone was following me in the pickup so when the Audi broke down, we could take the pickup out here and get the car hauler to go fetch the Audi. And once I got the car out here, all I would do with it would be to test European engineering in terms of bullet resistance versus whatever guns I could come up with. Now, all those things I'm telling you are based on my experience with those cars a long time ago. Maybe they've changed, but it doesn't matter how much you try to explain it to me. It doesn't matter if you tell me how great your Audi is, and by the way, I'm sure I'm already getting hate mail over this. I'm not going to believe you because that's my belief system. And you're not gonna change my mind. And the point of all this is, you have to recognize when you're dealing with somebody like that. And when I tell you, Audi, oh, no, no thanks, I'll walk. Don't try to change my mind because you're not going to. Don't bother. There's fence posts out there you can argue with. Now, the second part of that is talking about people and their baseless belief systems and not trying to change their mind. 
Recognize when you are that guy and change what you're doing. And when your belief system, when you realize that it's based on articles you read in American Rifleman magazine in 1983, you got to realize that maybe there's new information out there, maybe things have changed. You've got to make your conclusions based on evidence, based on what you see in terms of demonstration and things like that, that's a little more modern. Now when talking about trusting your ammunition and your firearm, I want to explain another thing when we're talking about basing your conclusions on the things you have seen. You have to have trust in that firearm. And that trust has to come from seeing it work. Seeing the demonstrations in things like this format. Knowing that it's going to work because you've seen it happen, because you've put it to the test yourself. And when you have the opposite of that, you've seen it not work, you've put it to the test and it's failed, and you don't have confidence, is when you're in trouble. Now, let me tell you some anecdotes to explain that. And again, I have to go back to a long time ago. Back in the days when virtually all police officers were carrying double action revolvers, four inch barrel, caliber 38 special. The police department in the city where I lived at the time, I mean, and this would have been again when I was a kid, they had a couple of shootings. Now, in this one I'm about to tell you about, I met the people that were there and I can tell you what they told me. There was a situation where one night they got a call and they're out in this residential area looking for a suspect and over here, there's a house that has nothing to do with anything that's going on. But the person who lives there has a German shepherd. And the German shepherd is creating some kind of disturbance. And the homeowner realizes there's somebody outside. So it just opens the door and lets the dog out. Well, the dog doesn't know any better. All he does is run across the street and attack the police officer that's over there. Who pulled out his Model 15 38 Special loaded with... 38 Special Plus P, 125 grain semi-jacket hollow points. Point blank shoots the dog a couple of times. The dog goes around a little bit, um, screaming and, and wounded. About then, the homeowner comes out, realizes what's going on. Oh, that's terrible. And asks the police officer to euthanize the suffering dog. So he puts his 38 right up to the German Shepherd's ear, shoots it, and it falls over dead. Then the other cops get there and all this stuff is going on. And about then, one of them realizes that dog isn't dead. They take it to the emergency veterinary hospital, save the dog's life. After that, the dog was deaf. But besides that, he made a full recovery. Now, either right before that incident or right after that incident, they had another shooting. One of their police officers shot the suspect, a human, through the thoracic cavity, the bullet was stopped by the skin on the opposite side. It did, in fact, stop the threat. But in recovering that bullet and recovering one of the bullets from the dog, they discovered that their hollow point ammunition had zero hollow point expansion. Now, at that time, my father worked for that police department, and he said, after these two events, and I can't tell you his exact words, but it was something like, that really shakes my confidence in our 38 hollow points. That really doesn't give me much confidence in our 38 hollow points. Something like that. And this is what I mean when you go to work every day knowing that you're probably not going to ever get in a shooting. But you might. And the day you get in a shooting might be today. You can't be doing that thinking, man... 38 Special is okay, but this ammunition they're giving us is terrible. Is my gun really going to work? I mean, it was hardly effective against that dog. Am I really going to be able to stop a threat with that, especially if the threat is on PCP or something? You can't live like that. So you have to 
have trust in your equipment. Now, let's do a demonstration. This is my Smith & Wesson Model 15 38 Special with a 4-inch barrel. I've put a different grip on it, but other than that, this revolver is identical to the revolvers that would have been used by that police department at that time. Now, the group on your left, which is about a 3-inch group, is me shooting deliberate slow fire offhand from about 20 yards. The group on your right is me shooting as fast as I think I can hit from 7 yards. Now, let's do another demonstration. Yes, there is a point to this, but remember you're watching the long version, so bear with me. Now, this is the meat target, and for those who aren't familiar with it, the meat target is leather couch skin, followed by pork steak pectorals, pork ribs, a bag of oranges to simulate lung tissue, more pork ribs on the back, four layers of t-shirt on the front, four layers of t-shirt on the back, and the whole thing followed by the new and improved high-tech police bullet stop. And I have my Model 15 loaded with the same ammunition I used to shoot that target, which is Remington Green and White Box 38 Special Plus P 125 grain semi-jacketed hollow point. I'll shoot the meat target from a distance of 10 yards, and let's see how well this ammunition performs. Well, I've got the meat target taken apart, and we see some pretty good damage to the ribs on the front of the target and where projectiles hit ribs shattered. We also see some pretty good damage to our orange lung tissue. Now our ribs on the back of the target just have holes through there. And again, where projectiles hit ribs, broke them. Now as far as penetration, one of the projectiles was stopped by the ribs on the back of the target. Three were stopped by the t-shirt on the back of the target, and one projectile made it through to about the 10th layer of fleece. Now let's take a close-up look at our projectiles. And here's our projectiles, and we see pretty good hollow point expansion. Not great, but pretty good. So what was the point of that demonstration? Let's start with the ammunition. You saw that it did pretty good damage to our meat target, and I called the hollow point expansion pretty good. Not stellar, but pretty good. Remember that that Remington Green and White Box 38 Special Plus P 125 grain semi-jacketed hollow point is not the same ammunition that that police department was using a long time ago. I really don't remember what they were using. Even though it had the same designation of plus P with 125 grain semi-jacket hollow point. I use that ammunition because up until the very recent problems we've had in the marketplace with ammunition, that ammo has always, for me, created a very good balance between performance, price, and availability at my local gun stores. And what the real point of the demo was is that I have profound confidence and trust in that ammunition in this revolver when I'm shooting it because I zeroed this revolver with that ammunition. I've owned this revolver for a long time. Don't think I've ever had a malfunction with it. In shooting targets, you saw the groups I got and they weren't stellar, but they were pretty good and certainly within acceptable limits for anything I'm going to do with this handgun. I've used this handgun in hunting, I've used this handgun in competition, and I have great confidence in it because I put it through all of those processes myself and I know what results I'm getting. Now I could say the exact same thing about this Beretta 92FS. I've owned it for a long time, I've used it in competition, I've used it in hunting, I zeroed it myself, I spent a lot of time on the range with it. If I've ever had any malfunctions, it was with some kind of really cheap aftermarket magazine I was testing, which failed the test. <laughs> it's been very reliable, and I have profound trust and confidence in it because I've gone through all those processes myself. And I could say the same thing about 
this Colt government model. I've owned it for a long time. I don't recall having any malfunctions with it. I zeroed it with the ammunition I use, and I know I can hit reasonably well with it. If you've seen some of my work in the past, you may have seen me engage targets at 100 yards with a Colt government model. I've used this for hunting, and I have great confidence in the Winchester Silvertip 38 Super Auto 125 grain jacketed hollow points that I use. And I have that confidence because I've taken this ammunition to the range, I've shot targets with it, I've shot the meat target with it, I've used this ammunition in hunting, I've killed two deer with this ammunition. I have great confidence and trust in these firearms and many others that I use because I have put in all that work myself. And I don't have to rely on just somebody telling me, oh yeah, use this, it's good. And sometimes firearms that don't work properly and that I can't make work properly, or sometimes I can't achieve the level of proficiency that I really require with them, end up destroyed and here at the Tree of Woe. Now we have to have a discussion on the difference between belief and trust or knowing. Belief is when you accept something to be true, even though you have no evidence, or at least no conclusive evidence, that it is. Trust, as I use it in this context, is you know your firearm is going to work because you've put it to the test yourself. You've gone to the range, put it through its paces, you put it to the test, and it's passed that test. Now, let me tell you an anecdote. It's far longer than it needs to be, but I think it will illustrate the point. This is a military issue canteen. And it's made of heavy duty plastic, and it's got a cap, and it's got this piece that keeps you from losing your cap. And traditionally, canteens like this one have a year of manufacture stamped on the bottom. Now, this canteen, I've had this particular one since I was 10 years old. My dad bought it for me at a secondhand store for 50 cents sometime in the latter part of the 1970s. And it's stamped on the bottom, 1965. Now, this is heavy duty plastic. It still seals really well. I use it all the time. I just got it out of my LBV right now. It's well over 50 years old and it's holding up pretty well. Okay, now here's another military issue canteen, also heavy duty plastic. It's got this piece to keep your cap from getting lost. Now this has the pro mask cap, but still. And this is also a good piece of equipment and it's stamped on the bottom, 1985. Okay, however, somewhere quite a while ago, I saw a canteen, the same type of thing, but it was made in 1980. And the one that was made in 1980 was so thin that if I held it up to the sun, I'm telling you, I think I could see through it a little bit. This piece here wasn't a separate piece. It was part of the cap. So every time you turn that, that would turn with it. <laughs> and it was just a chintzy, inferior piece of equipment. And I've noticed that about a lot of military equipment that was made late 70s to early 80s. And if you were in the military, give or take around that time, especially if you're a few years older than me, you may have experienced that. Now, when I went into the military in the latter 1980s, I was in the Marine Corps. And at that time, the Marine Corps was always pretty much the last to get the new equipment. So even though it was the later 1980s, we're still getting the stuff that was made in 1979, 1980. A good example is, even though the military officially adopted the Beretta M9 9mm pistol in 1985, yeah, several years later in the late 1980s, we were still using the rattly old 1911s, and there was no indication that we were going to get new pistols anytime soon. That's the way it was. Now, again, especially if you're a few years older than me, you may remember the boots that were being issued at that time that had that zigzag tread on the bottom of it, kind of a zigzag pattern. And if you had to walk very far on pavement, you didn't get very far before you wore that tread off and it became pretty much useless. The leather was stretchy, very low quality. No amount of polish or anything could make them water resistant at all. 
really inferior product. And it was something we talked about at that time is, yeah, most of the equipment we have is just really a poor quality and it was all made by the lowest bidder. Okay, well, also at that time when I was a Lance Corporal, I had a platoon sergeant that liked to say, you gotta have confidence in your gear, gents. Well, that's half right. And it was very indicative of a lot of things he did, kind of kind of half right. And just as Alfred Lord Tennyson said something to the effect of a half truth is among the darkest of lies, I'll tell you that being half right is among the most egregious errors. You do have to have confidence in your equipment, but you have to have equipment that's worthy of that confidence. You have to trust your equipment because you know it's going to work right because you put it through the paces you tested it yourself. Not because you were told to have confidence by somebody who thinks gents is a real word. And that's the difference between belief and trust or knowing. And so I talked in the beginning about recognize when you're talking to that guy, don't be that guy and then doing your research. And then point three is going to the range and proving things for yourself, putting your firearm through its paces, shooting a lot of rounds to make sure it is gonna function right. And that was the point of the demonstration with the 38 revolver. Well, we get to the thing of, okay, well, what if you put it through its paces and it doesn't pass the test? You don't develop trust in it. Well, you saw our tree. And I know that that's really easy for me to sit here and say, well, if it doesn't meet your standards and you realize you can't trust it, well, just trash the whole thing and start over. Really easy to say, not so easy for people to do. But it's something you really have to do because you can't be out there not trusting your firearm. Now, Someone contacted me, and I'm going to condense what he told me. He had an auto-loading pistol. It didn't work right, and he had to go through a lot of hassle sending it to the factory once or twice to finally get the thing to work correctly. And he said that now it works correctly, but he doesn't trust it. And that's what I want to discuss now is how do you develop that trust? And again, you go to the range and shoot it enough to where you get the trust in that firearm. And so you get a couple of hundred rounds, go to the range, shoot it, go home, do your PMCS, get a couple hundred more rounds, go back to the range next week and repeat that process until you fired that gun enough times that you know it's going to work. No part of you pulls that out of the holster and thinks, is this going to work? All of you thinks, of course it's going to work. And that is what you have to do. And if you get to the point where you've done that and you trust it, you're good. But that also brings up, what if you do that and you fire the thousand rounds and even though it works, you don't trust it? Okay, that brings me to point four. Now remember point one was recognize when you're dealing with that guy and don't be that guy. Point four is recognize when you are that guy and you're not going to change. Now I talked about me having no trust in Audis. Okay, I am that guy when it comes to that subject. And don't bother to try to change my mind because you're not going to. And that's something I have to know about myself. Well, that's easy. I don't trust Audis. I'll just buy a different car. No problem. But sometimes you have to recognize that your belief system is baseless. And I'm going to use the example of 380 ACP. Now, I was sitting in on just a classroom. It wasn't on the range. It was just a classroom class talking about concealed carry. And it was being taught by somebody that we called Pink-Haired Kevin. Now, he was a 45-year-old man that had dark hair, but he had a nice pink swoosh of hair through it. And he's talking about concealed carry, and he talks about how he always carries two guns. And as he's teaching the class, I can see that he's got at least six knives on his person. Six I could see. Who knows how many more I couldn't see. Okay. This is not someone who instills a lot of confidence. 
But he told this anecdote, and I'm going to tell you this, and remember, I'm just telling you what he said. I doubt very much that this was true. And he's talking about how 380 ACP is totally insufficient as a concealed carry gun. That's just not a powerful enough caliber. And he, and he illustrates that with the anecdote that there was someone in their own home who was about to sit down to dinner when they had an intruder come in. So the homeowner shoots the intruder five times with his 380, whereupon the intruder takes the pistol away from the homeowner, takes the steak knife off the table, kills the homeowner, then sits down and starts eating the homeowner's dinner. And was still doing so, even though he'd been shot five times, was eating dinner when the police arrived. Again, I doubt very much that that's true. But pink-haired Kevin represents that as being true. And the problem is some people are going to hear that and believe it and come to the conclusion that 380 ACP is insufficient because pink-haired Kevin said so. Now, if you think 380 is insufficient, that should be because you've done the research. You've looked at the studies and the stats. You've gone to the range and shot one. Not because somebody whose nickname is Pink-Haired Kevin told you that. But there are some people who are going to get to point four, and they're going to be that guy, and they're going to say, no, I don't trust it. No, I don't believe in it. No, not going to go with the 380. No matter if the police officer who contacted me tells you they had a rash of murders, six people were shot with the 380, they all died. No matter how many times you see me shoot, how many meat targets, or how many times you see other people shoot ballistic gel, no matter how many times I tell you that, yeah, in the right gun with the right ammo, with halfway good shot placement, it will be sufficient. You still don't trust it. And you realize that you are being that guy that's not really based on anything. If that's the case, you have to recognize that you are that guy and therefore go with a caliber you do trust. Now, there are some people that think that 9x19 is horribly insufficient. And if that's who you are, well, again, try to educate yourself. But if you get to the point where I don't care what the stats are, I don't care what anybody says, I don't trust it. If that's who you are, then you have to go get whatever you do trust regardless of what anybody tells you. And if that means you have to get a six inch barreled 44 Magnum revolver and carry that around, well, then you might want to think about seeking professional help. But if that's what you got to do, then that's what you got to do. Now, other people have that same kind of mentality when it comes to magazine capacity. I have sat here and told you many times that accurate statistics are very hard to get, but from what I can put together, it appears that the great majority of the time, a citizen will favorably resolve a self-defense shooting with six rounds or less. And so obviously having a magazine that holds more than that is great. And there's no reason not to have more rounds than that. But still, some people are going to say, no, no, that's not enough. And they're going to look at a 10-shot magazine and say, no, they, they don't believe in that. doesn't matter what the stats say. doesn't matter what I say. They want more than that. And if that means you have to go get a pistol that has a 20-shot magazine, well, if that's what you have to do, then that's what you have to do. Because the main thing you have to do is, when you get into a situation, you have to be thinking about the potential for collateral damage. Is that person a witness or an adversary? adversary, excuse me. You can't be sitting here thinking, gee, do I have enough rounds? Can I hit that from here? Is my gun powerful enough? You have to have that trust in your gear. And if you are, point four, that guy, and you realize that you have to have 20 rounds of 10 millimeter before you feel good about leaving the house, then you got to get a 10 millimeter, get full power 10 millimeter ammo, and figure out some kind of way you can have a 20 shot magazine. Obviously, always observe your local laws. So, to recap everything we've spent way too much time talking about, four points. One, recognize when you're talking to that guy. Don't try to change his mind because you'll have better luck talking to a fence post. But at the same time, don't be that guy. Two, do your research, do your homework, read the articles. Look at demonstrations and tests that are done in formats like this one and educate yourself. Three, get to the range and put that to the test. 
shoot enough rounds to where you have trust in that firearm, to where you know what the firearm's capabilities are and what your capabilities are. And if after doing all of your due diligence, you don't trust whatever ammo or firearm you're using, if at all possible, scrap it and start over. And finally, recognize when you are that guy and accept who you are and get the pistol and ammunition that makes you feel confident that you know will see you through regardless of what anybody else says. So, all that having been said, as always, don't try this at home on what you call a professional. Thanks for your attention, and thanks for watching the Difference Between Faith and Knowing video.